I think we should start. Uh, there might be some people come in more, but we'll see that later. Uh, first of all, my name is Jacques Bus. I am um, um, with an association, we, we set it up ourselves, which is called Digital Enlightenment Forum, which is in fact a platform for networks of and uh, networks of experts for Jacques having louder, a, I think. A even louder. even louder. Okay, then I maybe I should take the, the microphone. Yeah. So. <coughs> Oh, okay. Then, the the Digital Enlightenment Forum is a platform for multidisciplinary debate and policy development on uh, particularly the relation between. Might be better to stand because it's not actually there aren't yeah. speakers. There's no there's no amplification. Yeah. Oh okay. I thought that this was the only no, one that so was amplified. Okay, no problem. I will try to speak uh, louder. So for. The, in the area of digitization and society, we are trying to organize a debate there, and of course, uh, digital ethics is one of those issues that uh, forms uh, an important discussion in uh, the society if we think about inter IT and communication. Uh, if I think about digital ethics or ethics in general or ethics of uh, big data, then uh, you can have, of, co of course, have many, many questions uh, at practical level as well as abstract level. And I'm quite sure that we will not be able to handle them all this particular afternoon. Things that I am in particular interested in uh, from the discussion that we are also having ourselves, and this might be addressed partly this afternoon, is the question, can we come to a, an ethics framework as a basis for system de development, for, um, the ethical, for an ethical system in the sense from that systems can autonomously also cooperate and will have, of course, effects that have uh, ethical consequences. So, at the other side, if we have systems, we see often that we are just restrained by the systems and we will be forced to have a particular behavior. And what are the consequences of that? Can we um, be sure that we are living also in the future in a world of people facilitated by technology and not in a world of technology with people within the system? So I think these are, uh, this is an important issue in general. Uh, another thing, and one of the things that comes back all the time, and I heard it yesterday also in one of the debates, is the responsibility uh, for the various activities or various actions within a totally IT facilitated world. Uh, what, is, what about the personal and organizational responsibility? Uh, because in the end, ethics is about responsible handling of one actor versus another person or a patient, as uh, ethicists uh, call them. Um, and a very fascinating issue, basically, in my view, is what, uh, what about the dynamic evolution of an ethical system which consists for a large part of technology? Uh, would it still be possible that uh, human emergent behavior, that human creativity and so on would be able to have an effect on which rules are existing in the system and how these are being adapted to the particular situation that we are in, like we normally have that institutions and laws are being adapted due to what happens in life and due to the creativity of people that think that it should be, should be changed. So, can we make a, not, not just the ethics framework and platform, but can we make sure that this is a dynamic one that will uh, take in human creativity in the whole thing? And then of course, one of the main questions, one of the important questions is certainly if we think globally and the world is getting uh, more and more, society is more and more global now, what about the cultural dependencies of the moral rules in the global systems uh, because and you saw it partly in the discussion this morning between, uh, uh, between the EU and the FTC, 
Uh, as and clearly, uh, there are already a lot of differences in data protection. Uh, what if we are going to extend that to ethics in general? So <clears throat> I would like to keep it with here. I'm quite sure that the speakers will also raise a number of other questions. And you can, of course, raise your questions yourself. I give the word to the moderator, which is Robin Wilton, uh, director at ISOC. And I will, with lots of interest, follow your debate. Thank you very much, Ek. Um, so as, as the next stage of our experiment with the acoustics in this room, I'll try standing up and you can see which one, um, whether you'd like to encourage the rest to stand or not, we'll see. Um, I, I know all the moderators say this, but I do have a fabulous panel um, here today of people who I'm delighted accepted the invitation. Um, we have one uh, last minute substitution. Uh, Judith Rauhofer couldn't make it unfortunately because she was too ill to travel. Um, so Daniel Pradel from Hewlett Packard Enterprise has very um, kindly stepped in, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and uh, to show my gratitude, I'm going to go to Daniel first when I, did, when I introduced the speakers. Sorry about that. Um, but I know he has a few slides, so um, uh, we'll, we'll start with Daniel's perspective. Um, Daniel is the EMEA Privacy Officer for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Oh, by the way, I didn't ask um, any of the panelists for a short bio. So this is just based on what I found out about them. It may or may not be true, and I haven't, ha haven't got their consent to disclose any of this. Um, so, but I thought that was the best example I could set. Um, so uh, Danielle has played a key part in helping uh, Hewlett Packard fulfill a long-term strategy of getting certification under both the G29 binding corporate rule and the APEC um, CBPR, cross-border privacy rule schemes. Um, and, uh, of course, being based in Paris as he is, that has meant he has had to deal with the CNIL, who I think most of us would feel is probably one of the more active DPAs uh, in, in Europe. So I'm sure he's got some interesting war stories about that. Um, Michel Denedy here uh, is currently the CPO um, at Cisco, uh, where she's also a vice president. Um, uh, she has a, a history which I think is probably unique. Um, and I don't know of any other CPOs who've been doing it for 10 years. Um, Michelle and I were collaborators at Sun Microsystems, uh, where Michelle was CPO, and she then went on to exercise the same function at Oracle uh, after the acquisition of Sun, um, and then also did a spell at the Intel, uh, the McAfee division of Intel. Um, so she has a, a, a rich corporate experience of the CPO role um, and, and also has that vendor perspective of technology companies making things on which we then all depend. Uh, Michelle is also um, <coughs> author of the Privacy Engineers Manifesto, a book which I can thoroughly recommend. She said she'd sign my copy if I said that. Um, uh, Michelle is the recipient of an IAPP Vanguard Lifetime Achievement Award already, which is somewhat depressing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also the winner of the 2014 Stevie, the Gold Stevie Award for Women in Technology. The Stevies, whether you've heard of them or not, they're made by the same people as make the Oscars. Um, so the, the trophy itself is actually pretty good. It's really lovely. <laughs> uh, nearest to me, Gloria gonzalez Fusto, um, is a research professor and lecturer and one of our local speakers because uh, she's based here at BUV in Brussels. Uh, Gloria works on legal issues relating to fundamental rights, privacy, personal data protection and security and lectures on the protection of fundamental rights um, in European law. She's also the author of The Emergence of Personal Data Protection as a Fundamental Right of the EU, which came out through Springer in 2014. Uh, so now I'm... Oh, and yeah, Gloria is uh, so far the only other person I've met who has a YOLO smartphone like me. Yes. We don't have the tablet. <laughs> we, no, we we we're, we're, we're still waiting we're... for the tablet, but the smartphones are quite good. Yes. Uh, and l last but not least, uh, Gemma galvin Clavel. Gemma is the director and co-founder of uh, Ethicus, a um, consultancy and university spin-off based in um, Barcelona. And Gemma works at the intersection of technology, um, innovation, society, and ethics. Uh, Gemma is also a researcher in the University of Barcelona's sociology department. At least that was what I found when I was stalking, um, researching. Um, <laughs> she completed a PhD on uh, surveillance, security, and urban policy and has extensive links with universities in Catalonia and elsewhere. And she's on the advisory board of Privacy International. Um, so I really am privileged to have a lineup like that, and I hope we will get the best out of them. 
my sort of plan for this is that each of the four panellists is going to get a 10 minute slot within which I expect them to fit anything they want to say and then a question and answer with me and then if there's a burning issue from the floor we'll take one from the floor as well. I know that's quite a compressed thing and it's quite a challenge for the speakers um, but I do want not just to say that we want to involve the audience but actually to involve you and I don't want to do that by having an hour and 13 minutes of discussion here and then two minutes for you lot. Okay, so we're going to try and in involve you early and also leave a good sort of 15 to 20 minutes at the end for more Q&A. So store your questions up and uh, be ready to jump up and intervene. And with that, um, so Danielle, seeing see as you have got some slides, can we come to you first? Sure, Thank can you can find the slides. In theory. Uh -oh. It's an HP PC. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. The screen doesn't, uh, doesn't give the same. Or maybe just use this. See what yeah. happens. This is not a, this is not a mouse. Actually, it's on the screen, but it's not here. Yeah, it, was oh. up, it was up there before. So F okay, how the screen is positioned. Damn. Is there a technologist in the room? No, 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 it's working, it's working. It's, it's, it's here. No, it's working, yeah. Just go down. It is now. The other one, the second one. So you'll also notice yes. that we've, um, yeah. we decided not to have the Twitter no, fault. Because they had the wrong Okay, good, good. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll, I will try to, to speed up a little bit because in 10 minutes I have a few slides for at least uh, giving you the, the spirit of the, of, or the vision of HPE on that. First of all, let me explain that I'm not exactly, <laughs> not exactly the same job was described because in the meantime, that is November 1st last year, Hewlett Packard Corporation split in two different companies, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, which is roughly in charge of enterprise business uh, B2B and another one which is called HP Inc for the consumer PC and printers. And I'm now uh, working for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I'm the global director for strategic initiatives and external relationships. Then I'm directly involved in all this strategic visioning about uh, privacy, ethical approach and so on. So then I wanted to give you in a few minutes uh, the, the idea. Um, the, the subtitle of this slide by itself <laughs> is quite self-explanatory, saying that our vision is to consider that data protection should be considered further than just looking at the letter of the law, but really the raison d'etre, as we say in French and also in English, the spirit of the law. Then the first point is to consider that Data protection is a lot more than just regulation. When we think about a new product, a new uh, software, a new practice, and so on, we need really to consider three different intersecting areas. Regulatory is indeed the business, the technology, and also the societal dimension. What the application, what the software will do, how it will impact the society as a whole in terms of expectation, ethical consequences, and so on and so on. Then I will not go into details at all. I can send you the slide if you, if you like. Uh, please let me know at the, at the end of, of this, uh, this session. Then there is the need for a change of paradigm. Really having the companies and the regulators, everybody, this is not only private, but also public sector to think in terms of more than just liability to the law as it is today, but also think in terms of how the law will be or how the, the, the technology and society will consider certain processing tomorrow and maybe the day after tomorrow, especially with new technology. Then the idea is really to start from the compliance to the law as it is per today indeed, but also to consider all dimension of ethics, of value base, added to the, this reliability, uh, and we call that accountability. I know that there is a lot of different uh, interpretation of this term accountability. For us, accountability is something which could be translated by extended responsibility or holistic responsibility, that is considering that a company should uh, 
be accountable uh, about the consequences, the risks and the harms which could be created by some practices, for example, and to consider upfront the expectations of the, of the data subject. What, what does it bring? Well, why we are doing that? Uh, we do that because we consider that a lot of technologies will fail or will significantly be impacted negatively indeed if we don't consider upfront this concept of uh, trusted uh, acceptance by, by, the, by the users, by the data subject, then this idea of accountability with ethics embedded will provide this trust, will also support this global interoperability because it goes above all the different uh, different local regulation. This is really providing some uh, some umbrella above everything. It will help to address new challenges. If we think about Internet of Things, big data, and so on, uh, it will it will help to foresee how the spirit of the law will be for these technologies tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, as I said, and ensure in ensure effective data protection. A way to consider. Uh, this is to look at the whole range of different types of risks. On the left hand side, you have what we call the company focused risks. The first one being indeed the compliance, the reputation, which is often these days more uh, impactful than the compliance. It may change with the GDPR indeed. The investment risk, when we develop a new product, we need to consider that, the reticence, business continuity, and so on. But the most important for this session is the right side. Considering what are all these outside looking risks in terms of data subject expectation risk, the ethical risk, what will happen, for example, if we develop uh, a big data uh, research and suddenly we discover some non-ethical result based on this analysis, which could be done on purely public and non-sensitive information. We know that we can discover something very uh, risky in terms of ethics and, and sensitivity, and the other is regarding cyber sensitivity, cyber security, sorry. Then, this is another way to, to look at it, how we can do that as a company. Uh, first of all, there is, as said before, a change in the type of business, from the traditional one on the left to the what we call the new style of business with a, a lot of uh, ubiquitous collection, uh, some new concepts, sometimes a little bit misused, such as legitimate interest, distributed controls, and so on. And we need in the middle to have some bricks providing solutions, uh, some, some base for developing this uh, ethical approach. Indeed, having this as I said before, this organizational accountability, which may provide, by the way, a sort of organization adequacy, more or less parallel to the country adequacy. Then we need to develop with the regulators some co-regulatory framework and some to consider this ethics and social responsibility. Then in practice, what's an example? Here you have a work, a project we started a few time ago and uh, on which we work with the HPE labs and you have some people from the HP labs in this, uh, in this room today and we can give you more information on that. But we, we decided to start a, a work with all the companies and also with several regulators thinking about a way to develop, to co-develop, this is co-regulation, what we call a big data code of ethics. And this big data code of ethics, which is something which exists, which is available, we, we are at the end of the project, has different elements. The first part is the description of what we call the unified ethical framework. What are the different ethical dimensions we need to consider before doing a big data project? Then the, the next part is uh, developing some guidance to the data scientists, to the marketing people, or to, to the developers, how to identify the key issues uh, on this project and to be careful about the, the, the main danger of this development. The next one, the part C, mm -hmm. is a mechanism for enforceability. This part specifically 
will be developed in collaboration with, uh, with, with, with DPAs, and the DPAs will use this, these mechanisms to enforce this big data code of ethics. And the last part, the part D, is in fact the translation of part B for a specific sector. If we want to apply this big data code of ethics on, I don't know, on, uh, on, on health research or on some, some other domain, there, there will be a specific translation modification of this part B in part D. Then, as a summary, very quickly, because of the sake of time, we fully support and we, um, we have been um, promoting uh, an approach with regulators and with all parties involved and the, the, the uh, academics and others uh, to have this consistent and coordinated dialogue really to work together. And I use very often an image which is uh, self-explanatory saying that uh, the industry, the regulators, the academics and so on, we are all, all working together for exactly the same objective which is to fulfill the expectation of the data subjects like you and me. Then, the end of my presentation will be on two quotes I personally like. The first one from Albert Einstein, saying that we need to change the way of thinking because all the situation we have today was we have developed with the thinking we had maybe five or 10 years before, and we need really to change the paradigm, the, the mindset. And the other one, uh, it, which is an answer to some people saying that this is, there is a lot of challenges, this will be very difficult, yes and no. Uh, personally, I'm uh, fundamentally optimistic, and I think that we have issues, we have challenges, but this is really an opportunity to uh, do something better, something uh, uh, innovative. That's it. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, I, I'm going to come back to you actually in, in the closing section with a question about how things like cross-border privacy rules make the transition from the regulatory to the ethical, because I think that introduces some cultural differences and I'd be interested to see how, how your model adapts to that. But um, rather than me do that, is there a question from the floor at this point? And we do have a mic. Actually, no, the microphone doesn't really. That's true. Anyone got a question they'd like to ask? It's a nice small room, you don't have to be shy. <laughs> You're being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay, in, in that case, what well, I think we'll do. Um, Michelle, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, okay, so I'll just hand over to you. Okay, Let's, so let me know if it's over 10 minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll ding you at about Throwing five Throwing things up in my way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're told that the best panels are made up by controversy, and unfortunately, I hate to disappoint, because um, I agree very much with what Danielle um, has been working on, and, and through the, the various companies I've worked with over the years, um, HP has always been kind of that shining uh, standard of ethical conduct. Um, when, I, when I published the book, The Privacy Engineer's Manifesto, initially, um, it, it is a book about translating global policies into specifications and requirements um, for building systems for developers on enterprise level as well as very small two-person app development. Um, and then it, the, the final part of the book talks about values, how you build organizations around this and how you really value your values. And so I, I think this whole conversation around ethics um, I think are, are part of the fundamentals of how we actually do privacy engineering. And it's called the manifesto and not engineering because there's so much room to create tools and standards and patterns um, that really comprise what truly engineering means. Engineering never was intended to mean just technology and certainly not information technology. The definition of engineering is actually using the materials available to solve a problem. And the problem can be, and I love the Winston Churchill reference because a, a problem can be that I would like to talk to my mother, but she lives 3,000 uh, kilometers away. Uh, the problem can be that I have a global organization to run and a series of individualized and jurisdictionally based laws. So solving problems for ethics, I think first requires really an examination of do we have a universal set 
of ethics, and I'm glad we've got real expert academics here to, to enlighten us more. But at the bottom, the bottom line from a, a pragmatist perspective is uh, the program that I'm currently running to do privacy engineering at Cisco um, is called Values to Value. So the amazing thing that happens, particularly in the private sector, is if corporations are able to attract more customers, decrease churn in employee base or customer base, or, or figure out a way to differentiate themselves in the marketplace, they're a lot more encouraged to actually invest in certain protocols. So when you take the value of data protection and privacy, and you put it into and incorporate the specifications for building large networked systems, and you show that when you are able to understand things like geolocation, when you can parse information into proportional data processing, when you are able to delete information according to context and time, all of those things we find on one hand of the building specification are values to us as, as data protection professionals. But at the end of the day, once you have a set of specific requirements and specifications throughout the build cycle, and, and we happen to use an agile model, your scrum masters who are your daily operations, there's a smile over there that she knows what agile is. Yay, women engineering, I love it. Um, and scrums. And scrums, so you know, if you, is, there, is who's familiar with the terms agile and scrum? Okay, there's a handful. So I'll, I'll just do a quick, quick, quick thing. Is when when you're developing something, waterfall is kind of the the uh, method where requirements start at the beginning. Everyone has a big meeting, and then everybody builds whatever the thing is that you think you're going to build. And then at the end, everyone comes together and says, "What are the defects here in the system?" I know I told you it was a very broad overview. It's not very precise, but it's very broad. I'm not wrong, That's right? Good. No, no, yeah. So the it's problem at the, end the, at the end of the program, you deliver the thing proudly, and everyone tells you what's wrong with it. Here it, it is, <laughs> yeah. And then everyone throws things. And, and here's what happens: a funny thing happens on the way to the ethics table. When you have ten thousand bugs or defects, and you have a timeline to get this product out, and you've already invested in it, guess where the privacy requirements go? They're like down here. We can't even call them a feature that they're not there, like we do with the other defects. <laughs> So the interesting thing with Agile, and I'm not, I'm not a cheerleader for Agile, but you have you know, kind of like in a rugby football scrum where everyone gets together. The scrum master is the daily or weekly um, person who comes in to check and see that the building of whatever the product or services is, is being built according to the same specs that you thought you were building to. I mean, amazing, right? Like you're building a house. You would never be like, oh, I think I'll work in a window today. I'll go over there and work on a doorknob. And oh, yeah, they're not connected. Bummer. <laughs> when you consistently have the same set of requirements, and one of those requirements is, I shouldn't say one, the cascading fair information principles and ethical guidelines are known specifications of things that you want to become an outcome of the system that you're building. And you have that supervisory granular authority of a scrum master that says, for example, this is an application that will be attached to someone's body as a wearable. So we know that information will have a wireless capability. So traditionally, we figured out how to make that happen. Zero or one. Is it wireless? Is it not? Is it communicating? Is it not? With privacy engineering and ethics, values to value, we also realize that the purpose of the device is to collect certain information about a human being. So is it a zero or a one that there's some sort of either segmentation so that the information is not being spread out to the world? Is there some sort of marker on that data so that it can be limited in function? There's a plethora of engineering creative choices that can happen. And, it, and they do differ and they will differ. And my ethics may come out to be different than other people's. But here they're documented. Here they're planned for. Here, when you have a stack of two defects, because you're doing a regular assessment of privacy the whole way as you're building systems, you have a much greater chance that those trade-offs at the very end of a complete system will be addressed in place and in time. And where technology can't meet that, to, to Jacques' wonderful statement at the very beginning, we want these to be person-centric and data-centric networks first, not people adapting to technology as we've done in the past. I think that's the, the real turning point right now, 
And so if we have a human-based network, shouldn't we build, be building for the principles of humanity, some of which are ethical principles, some of which are just, you know, what do we want our cultures to look like? How do we want our cultures to interoperate? We know how to do technical interoperability. <coughs> Certainly we can figure out how to share information cross-border. Certainly we can do this. If anyone saw the great graphic um, that Wired Magazine put out on Tor router traffic, it turns out the cloud isn't some mysterious thing that you see on slides. It's under the Atlantic Ocean. The bulk of processing that happens today in the world by a huge, vast majority doesn't happen on any of our dirt. So if we can't figure out how to ethically transfer information, we're not going to progress on really what are our, our values really and how do we want to explore them and how do we want to express them and how do we want to be transparent and accountable so that where we have a dispute about collection or processing or deletion of information or policing how we want to police our societies or have a judicial record um, so that people can be accountable either in a civil or a criminal court of law, we will actually have those structures in place to create that forensic record. So that's so, the balance that I think we're playing with. So Michelle, you, I mean, you, you said at the beginning that the best, the best panels are ones with a big controversy. So let me try and in, inject something. Bring it on, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you introduced the idea that if you have an idea of values to value, that helps to bubble ethical and security type issues further up the list of priorities than they might otherwise be. Um, isn't it true that at the moment we've got a very clear principle of purpose of use for the collection of personal data and that actually we're making a complete mess of putting that into practice? Um, so are the prospects actually any better for considering the purpose of something when we're doing the ethical design or are we going to make as big a mess of that? We're going to make a different mess. Okay. Right. <laughs> we will make a mess. And the mess will be that we are going to have some serious disagreements about what we think things like proportionality are. Or, you know, I saw on a previous panel um, certain categories of data should be banned from this. And I thought, how are we banning anything at this point? Do we really know? Good luck with that. Yeah, and good luck with that. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's the other interesting fiction about some of the the if you if you try to do a compliance only type of a pragmatic and I you know I, I I'm not an academic I I'm stuck with a shovel and a bunch of manure in the corporate side of the house so I can only do like tangible stuff um, some of these debates of oh my surveillance is better than yours and it's exhausting to me I have customers on both sides I have to make sure your information is safe and secure I want to make sure that nobody gets blown up if I have information that is is pertinent um, and exigent, someone had better prove to me that it is, and we have a very difficult time, given proportionality, proving that point. Um, and then the other point is, I think there's so many unexpected things that happen. Some are quite beautiful, and some are quite destructive. So some of these things um, that, you know, the, the key case in the United States is the, the target um, targeting of a very I hesitate to call her a woman. I have a 14-year-old daughter. The, the girl in question was 14 and was pregnant. And the way that Target figured out someone was getting less perfume products and ordering certain things, and obviously a pregnancy test is pretty telling, um, and then sent these coupons to this young child's home, and her father was somewhat disturbed <laughs> because he did not know about this. Um, so that is a very unexpected outcome that has social implications. Another one that, that um, on, in the law enforcement side is we're having more and more uh, large sized tablets in, in police cars. And often what happens, um, so for example, in domestic disputes or in, a, in an assault case, a full police record will include the victim's full name and address and the complainant's phone number and such things. If it's sitting on a tablet, in a squad car, your only encryption capability is how drunk the guy is in the back. I don't think we want to count on you know, security by drugs. That seems like a different kind of bad value judgment. So, I mean, just call me crazy here, not an ethicist again, but that seems cuckoo. But we do, we can, um, if, 
the purpose is policing whilst um, protecting a system of records so that you know law enforcement doesn't get the right suspect, et cetera, and they have all the evidence, you can create a system of record and then plan into the system for the privacy of the victim and even the privacy of the perpetrator so that the police isn't looking at this person as, as a repeat offender versus something else or, or something that they've been charged with and treating them in a discriminatory fashion. So I think there's, there's a lot of different wrong things that we're gonna do, but I, I think that we will be less wrong um, if, if in the beginning we, we start to think about what do we really care about in terms of privacy and values and ethics. And, and we have to be very clear and specific about this because otherwise when you present changing the way everyone develops or purchases everything in your corporation, you have an economic pressure, at least in the private sector, that's very real, and you have to somehow correlate your doing things better with delighting your customers more, with making your, your uh, company more viable, with um, all sorts of other kinds of value as in hard currency value. Um, so both of those things, uh, I think, absolutely should be in your specification requirements rather than looking at a bunch of guys who went into technology because they were afraid of people and saying, which, you know, I'm one of them, Should so whatever. Do. <laughs> Don't judge me. So, so um, I think that we've got um, so lots of lots of issues to follow up. Among them, I, I have think, so many issues. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think both both you and Danielle have hinted at something which we haven't gone into in detail yet, which is um, how does ethics or an ethical approach survive the commercial pressures that inevitably um, are, exercise a much greater influence on most of the development process. But before we get to that, again. Quick call for any questions from the floor? This You're is just shy, wrong. We've provoked shy, you. We it? will do karaoke. <laughs> it is possible. Nope. OK. Gloria, yes. would you like to I will do my best at bringing the controversy in. Uh, so yes. So uh, it's, a very, it's a pleasure for me to be here. As you heard, I'm a legal scholar. I work with, on data protection law. So it's a pleasure for me to be here, but it's, al it's also painful in a way. It's conceptually painful for me to be uh, involved in an ethics discussion because I'm not an ethicist. I am from the academia, but I'm working on law, legal issues, data protection law, and I'm invited to a discussion on ethics. And coming from the academia, I'm supposed to be reflecting on these issues. It is uh, conceptually painful. But I, I, will, I have to say it's not exceptional. Actually, it's part of my normal life to have this conceptual pain because I'm regularly in, uh, invited to ethical, eth ethics discussions, ethics boards, ethics uh, panels, I think sometimes even by, by HEMA. So we, 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 uh, it's something that happens to me regularly. I, I'm, I'm treated uh, as an ethics expert, I even sometimes paid as an ethics ex expert. So I'm, I'm used to this uh, conceptual pain. You, you may wonder if it's so painful for me as a, as a legal scholar to be treated as, a, as, a, as an ethics expert. Why do I do it? Well, actually, because I discovered that most of the time when people say ethics, they really don't mean it. They, they mean whatever, something else, but they don't mean ethics. I think that what I, sometimes when I hear uh, as these big data ethics discussions, uh, digital ethics discussions of coming from corporations, I think this is pretty much what we used to call self-regulation, but with a, with a new, more trendy name. For instance, when I called by the European Commission to go to ethics review panels, they actually, they really don't, uh, they are not caring about ethics. When you go there as a data protection uh, expert, you realize that actually what they want is a data protection expert that knows what is the, the, the law of applicable law and they have all these questions about data protection law. So this is why, because I, I, I realize this fact that they say ethics but they mean something else, that I'm, I'm actually going to this uh, kind of meetings because actually I think that if, if we don't go as data protection law experts, well, this expertise is missing, and these other people that consider themselves ethicists have then to, to say something supposedly relevant about data protection law, and then we get into a real, real trouble. Now, this is the, my normal life, but I, I realized that today, actually, perhaps when Robin invited me to this panel, he was really meaning that we were really going to talk about ethics, and that I, I could not just say, ah, I don't talk about ethics, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a legal expert, so I, I don't want, no, so I, I accepted actually the, the challenge. This is why it's a pleasure to actually be here and try to talk and say something relevant and perhaps useful about, about ethics. And uh, the, the challenge for me is to, to, to try to figure out what could be from my perspective the, the, uh, something meaningful from, uh, with an ethics dimension. 
I'm not that scared because I understand if corporations and engineers can say something about ethics, of course, lawyers, we, we can also say it. And, and I think it's, it's uh, so my starting point has to be this one. What is the difference between law and ethics? Because they are different things. And I think here, until here, pretty much everybody agrees that law and ethics are different things. And then we, if we ask the, the question, what is the difference between law and ethics? This is where, when we get into the real, real fun. Because it's, uh, if you ask this question to uh, real ethics, ethics experts, they normally tell me, well, we all know the difference between law and ethics. Law is this boring thing that it's written there that nobody cares for, nobody applies. And ethics is these great ideas that we have that will save us. And this is what we have to go for. Law is something that is, doesn't have a spirit. And, or is, and ethics is the spirit of, of, of what uh, lacks the spirit. So this is uh, what the, the, the others tell, tell us that law is. I, I, I'm not sure uh, the, this is the, the case. I have been working on, on what the European data protection law is and trying to think from the ethics perspective. I, I think uh, basically data protection law is this idea that we all have a right to the protection of our personal data. It's quite basic. The idea is we all have this right equally to the protection of our personal data. And I think from this basic idea, I can tell you what I think ethics should be in this area of data. It should be the idea that we are actually not equal when our data are being treated. This is one. And, and the second idea is that it's not about our data. It's about data of others, about information of others. So these two dimensions, there is in law, in data protection law, we have this fiction. We, we imagine that we are all equal in, in front of surveillance. We are all equal in front of data protection practices. I think if we take an ethics dimension, we have to admit we are not. And, I have, and, I, and I'm very happy that this example from the, the supermarket thing about the pregnant girl came out. For me, is one of, of the, you, you, so, so this, this is an example that comes back every, every, every year at CPDP. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a clear example of how uh, this, for instance, the, the, the gender distinctions in surveillance are very, very important. You take this example, so there's a pregnant uh, girl, woman, that is surveyed by, by a supermarket. Okay, she's the, the, tar the target of the, of the surveillance. Then the father discovers there's a problem, and normally the, the second part of the story is actually the father goes to the supermarket and he complains. Why, why is not the girl uh, supposed to complain? Why is she, if she's the object of surveillance? Why is the father the one that, that complains? The she's one locked in a room. <laughs> <laughs> she's grounded. Yes, yes, yes. But but just just to give you this, this is the example. So I really think we have to be aware of this fact through our. And if you have want to have an ethics discussion of, of the way how uh, the, the data protection process, uh, processing practices are not equally directed towards different uh, uh, groups in society. And different groups in society are not equally equipped to, to actually fight for their rights. I always uh, I'd like to remember, for instance, this, the, the case of Max Rems. You know, there's this, uh, sort of rhetoric around Max Rems, like a, 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 a simple student could fight against uh, the, 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 the big, the big uh, company. And, and actually, of course, it's, it's a, well, he was a student, but he was a student that was uh, spending one year in, in, in Silicon Valley or somewhere. Not all students in Europe spend one year in, in, in Berkeley or, or whatever. So he, he was a certain kind of smart and privileged student. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, is, this explains why most of the students that are on Facebook cannot complain and will not complain unless we do have a, a different uh, clear uh, perception of the ethics challenge that are there. So this is one. And the other question is this, that it, it should not be about me. It should not be just about us. I mean, of course, my personal data will be protected through uh, data protection law. I, should, I have this right to care about my data. But more widely, we should care also about the data of the others, or what happens to the others when somebody processes our data. So uh, this, this reflection about what are our values, I would say, from uh, my ethics perspective, I don't care about my values. I, I care about the fact that the other people's values could be inserted somewhere. That's my, 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 my perspective. How, how could we then go beyond uh, data protection law and use ethics then to, to do this movement beyond data protection law, beyond the individual, and I don't know, I, of course, if, if, if in the end this is called ethics, this is called politics, I don't know, but we have to move, take this step from the indiv individual for, to the, the collective. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you, Gloria. And I don't think it's any coincidence, is it, that when you see statues of justice, she has a sword in one hand and she's blindfolded. 
So I think there's, you know, that, that idea that, that um, differences and, and, and inequalities are almost intentionally set aside by the law because it has to treat everyone the same way and therefore ethics may be the dimension where that level of inequality can be adjusted for. Um, okay, uh, so in the interest, I think, of time, what we'll do, um, Gemma, can we come straight to you? And I think that should leave us a good, a good 10 minutes or so to get you lot out of your shyness. <laughs> Maybe it's just, is it the after lunch thing? Is everyone digesting food and not information? Anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll come to that. Must be that. So, um, first, I, I totally feel um, Gloria's conceptual pain. Um, I feel it all the time as well, but I love it. Uh, I think that it's great to have the chance to not preach to the converted. And I think that that's when you experience the pain, when you're out of your comfort zone and trying to say the things that you believe in in a way that an, an alien audience will understand. And I think that's, that's the core of what we do from different, from different places. So in order to give you some some context on what I do because I yes I am an academic and yes I have a PhD and yes the methods of academia really inform what I do but I I started a company two years ago and that forces you to deal with real life problems and you have to force you, yourself out of the academic bubble and force the things that you're used to working with to make sure that they have some practical value to the people to these alien audiences that you um, that you talk to um, also, to give you a, an, an, some idea of what's happened, we started Ethicus two years ago, three people, um, and that was the beginning, late 2013. So in early 2014, there was three of us. Late 2015, there was 17 of us. And we start this year with over 1 million euros in signed contracts, which is crazy. But I think it shows, I'm not saying this to brag, I'm saying this because it shows that there's a window of opportunity that it's opening. And we've kind of grown along that window of opportunity. And we're trying to make the most um, of that, that possibility with the European Commission realizing that the, um, the social impact of data intensive technologies is a problem with lots of privacy disasters happening all the time, products that don't sell because no one thought about their social impact, because no one thought about the ethical implications of what they were um, developing. So it's been a hell of a ride. And, and now we have 70 people from very different backgrounds, from law, and I don't, I, I don't hire lawyers. I hire people who understand the spirit of the law because that's what you need in order to apply old laws to new technologies. I think that's the only way you can understand what social norms inform those laws and how to retrieve those social norm norms and inform the social norms of the of the future. So we have people with a with a background in law, people coming from sociology, policy like myself, but also engineering. One of the things that I realized when I started working on the ethical impact of technology was that um, if I was only someone saying something broad at the beginning, then it was so easy for engineers to fool me. So I wanted to make sure I could audit how they were taking into account the things that I was, um, that I was saying. So we, a third of, of our workforce is, um, is engineers. So um, what did we do? We started working on this fantastic field. Uh, we got money from different bodies saying, help us assess the social impact of these technologies, the ethical impact of these technologies. We're like, okay, let's look at what's out there. Let's see what methodologies are being used. So we looked at privacy, in, uh, privacy impact assessment, um, at ethics, and we realized that it was not very much defined. Um, responsible research and innovation, value sensitive design, technology impact assessment. And we didn't like any of them. They, were, they, they all had something useful. There were lots of buzzwords that really seemed to talk about something real, but the way they were assembled was just not useful for the kind of technologies and fields where we were working. So we said, we said okay, let's, let's take the difficult route here. We will not be able to just recycle somebody else's approach. Maybe we need to come up with our approach. Um, and that's, and that's, what we, that's what we did. And we started from several things that we found in this process, but two that I think are, are quite um, crucial. First that legal was not enough, that acceptable was very important. We kept seeing technologies that were legal, 
but failed because people did not accept them. So there was something about understanding the people that you're going to be relating to and the people that your technology is going to be interacting to. So this, this step between legal and acceptable was very important. And that forced us to look beyond the code, beyond the law, to understand issues related to um, social um, interactions, social developments, cultural issues, etc. But also what I said before, that a pre-assessment was just not enough. You needed to be able to audit but also not, not, on, not only audit, like, you know, you're the person outside who's just looking down at the engineers and being like, you're not doing this right. We saw there was a lot more lack of knowledge than bad faith. So we work with large companies and engineers, and I have hardly ever come across someone who's like, you know what, I don't care about privacy and I don't want to care about privacy. Or I don't care about ethics and I don't want to care about ethics. More pe most people are like, I'm curious, but I need you to speak my language. So if I understand what you're saying, I can translated this into code or into the specifications of what, I'm, of, of, of what I'm developing, but I need to understand what you're saying. And oftentimes we speak different languages. So it's not, it's, if it's not bad faith, there's something we can do. There's a, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of training and translation. So with those two things in mind, we developed um, yeah, a framework which is based on four main boxes of things. And there's some overlap, but this helps us organize the way we look at the different technologies that we work on. So we, whenever we have a technology before us, we look at desirability, utility, impact, and cost, acceptability, social context, and the stakeholders, co-design issues, ethics, which is the legal, the norms, but also the, um, the moral standards, trust, social cohesion, etc. And finally, data management, which kind of brings everything together. Data management is the problem, but it's also the solution. So anonymization, data minimization, how do you actually deal with this data? And for us, it was very important to land everything on this issue of um, data management. So what we do in any project that we take part on is we try to draw the data life cycle. And so we talk to the engineers and we work with them and say, okay, so where do you get the data and what do you do with it from the beginning till the very end? This is a very painful process because they've never thought about data in those terms. <laughs> but we get, but that, that's something that in the end we can get to um, understand each other. And so we draw this and we, we, we identify the moment of data collection, data storage, data analysis, sharing, and deletion. These are, these are the five key moments in the data life cycle. And each moment has its own vulnerabilities. And so we address them from an ethical and academic perspective, doing research, mm -hmm. but also from an engineering perspective. So what things can we do to mitigate the vulnerability of this moment? So you want to share your data. What are the things that you need to take into account? So you, who do you want to share it with? Is it in, in the EU, outside of the EU? Will cultural issues play a role? Will it just be a legal issue? Will acceptably, uh, acceptability issues play a role? The same with deletion analysis, storage, or, um, or collection. And this seems to work. As I said, it's very painful at the beginning because engineers don't really think of data in this way. But I think this is a middle ground that we can build, that we as social scientists understand, and they can also um, walk towards. And this seems, to, this seems to work. And then finally, we just use lots of academic tools to assess all these things that I told you about about desirability, acceptability, and ethics. So we play with surveys and interviews, yes, but also with stakeholder mapping, um, co-design tools, uh, reflexive process description. We even do cost-benefit analysis, taking into account intangible values, values such, as, such as privacy. And this seems to work, and it's allowed us to have something to say in different fields. Like, we work a lot on border technologies, for instance. And what we have to do when we are faced with the development of a biometric border gate, for instance, is how do we build the Western notion of citizenship into this machine? How do we make sure that the data management process of this machine understands why a citizen has different rights than a non-citizen? And who should be checked against one database and not another database? All these things that constitute who we are as European, as Western citizens, we need to make sure that the, the machine is able to reproduce this same process. And that is extremely hard, but possible. And actually, we are coming up with solutions and ways to make sure that the machines work in favor of our values and not undermining them behind, behind um, our backs. So that's just what I wanted to share with you today, that there, is, there are ways, and I think there are nascent ways of addressing the challenges of 
the ethical impact of data intensive technologies or of any kind of technologies that we are exploring them and that it is a thriving, um, a thriving field that I'm hoping more and more people will contribute to. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much Gemma. So if anyone was in any doubt that the ethical issues around data processing affect our daily lives, I, I don't think you could do better than that last example. In a week where um, I believe uh, the Schengen countries in Europe have um, proposed suspending the Schengen Agreement for a minimum period of two years because of the difficulty of managing that whole question of citizenship, non-citizens' rights when entering the EU and or crossing borders within it. So there's a, a very clear example of where um, the processing of data um, has to map very clearly onto categories of people but to do so in a way that respects their rights, um, whether or not they're citizens, because they're human beings. And, and, and that, I think, uh, is, is also an illustration of how all of this is worthless if it doesn't reflect the social values um, that, that, that guide where we want to go, rather than where the technology um, constrains us into going. So. Uh, Okay, next next call for questions from the floor. Yes, Shani. Yeah, there's something I'm struggling with. I'm, I'm not an expert in ethics, but there, I know that there are these different views on, on what's yeah. ethical. And we'll come to that. Yeah, Charles has put his hand up, so oh, I think, oh, yeah. Right. But okay, so here So it seems to me you're raising. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to see if I've captured the two issues right, because I think you're raising two issues. First one is if you go to an ethicist or a philosopher and say, what are the dominant ethical models? What answer will they give you, and will it be any use? Um, and I can do that in a bit if there's time. Um, well, I'm saying that you'll get different answers from different people. Yes. And, and how do you resolve that? Which one would you pick? Right, yeah. and, and is there a pre preferred or dominant one? And then the second one is. Um, more about how you engage appropriately with the different stakeholders in order to put that um, model into practice. Yeah, okay. So um, let's park those for a second. Charles, do you want to come in? Because I saw your hand going up. Yes, I will. Is there an ethicist in the room? <laughs> <laughs> seems to me that there are different schools of ethics. And if you ask companies that are trying to make this ethical framework, well, what kind of ethical uh, theory do you subscribe to? Is it the kind of the deontological uh, theory, or is it utilitarian, or virtue ethics, or what? Because unless you dig below that surface, the relationship you're making, you may come out with different uh, frameworks, different codes of ethical ethics. conduct, which will lead in perhaps different Yeah. 
a fine end to that, a, an example that puts a fine end. I think um, when we in the adult world talk about cross-generational privacy, um, we, we hear time and time and time again that, that kids don't care about privacy at all, look at their behavior, it shows you that they want to share everything with the world. And so my answer to that is always, um, you know, back in the 1920s, 1950s, 1920s, uh, Updike wrote this great book called The Jungle in the United States. And, and it basically was talking about meat processing in the turn of that century and the fact that a lot of the, the, the meat that was being put out was you know, scrap meat, sawdust from the floor, rats, whatever they could get their hands on. So if you looked at the behavior of particularly impoverished and, and immigrant communities in Washington and Chicago, and you looked at it, you did a big data analysis, you would come up with the conclusion that poor people like eating dogs and rats and sawdust. And the reality was, A, it was their only option, and B, they didn't know. So that's when we came up with food, food safety and standard and transparency and labeling and those sorts of things. So I think it's, it's, it's very um, difficult when you're talking about building in ethics that you, you don't kind of create your own self-recursive, self-serving loop, but also that you take a, a step back and kind of look at the real impact and make sure that ice cream isn't causing summer. <laughs> Uh, this, because thank you for your, for your questions. I think the, 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 the questions are re really relevant, and I would say for me that the big question is, is who needs ethics? Because indeed we are all like very keen to develop ethics and to choose our favorite mo model, but who, for whom are we developing ethics? Because I have the impression sometimes we want to develop ethics for the others to, to uh, apply, or, or what, what is the purpose to, of this ethics development when we are trying to our, on our own develop our ethics that, that we will use to what? And, and I have the, the, the impression now in Europe we see basically two uh, actors being interested in, in developing this, those ethics. We have the, the industry doing about this big data ethics, and we have the EDPS, and I think there's something in common with the two um, ethics moments, is that it, it, it tends to be like a, a sort of global possibility, possible solution, that we all have a common ethics, and, and this will indeed help in, in the way uh, global discussions about law have failed. So we, it's impossible apparently for us to have this uh, um, agreement of what law should do, but maybe if we talk about ethics, we could try to find a theory of ethics that will get uh, this dialogue. And I think that could be the, the interesting dimension of it for the industry, for the EDPS, and for everybody. But indeed, these are very relevant questions. Um, yes, well, so, okay, it's so got two questions there, and then Joe would like a word as well. Let's uh, take the floor first. No. Sure. Sure. Uh, I think it's even more complicated because if you want to answer the question, what kind of society do you want? Well, you enter politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, good, thank you. Um, yeah. uh, one example of an unethical practice like the targeted farm, far, targeted farming. Can you give just a couple more examples of unethical practices? It's so much easier to Well, I think if you look at, um, and apologies if you're anyone's a data broker here, <laughs> if you look at the, the kind of um, the dark market of data right now, uh, I don't think any of us, if you're not in one of these big brokerages, really understand the commerce that has been going on for the last 50 years, before it was even digitized, of assessing um, where someone should live and what kind of offers they should get what kind of credit they should be given, what kind of rates they should be given, how do we figure out what kind of mortgages they should pay. I mean, these are very directly um, dispositive processing that we really don't have participation in or, and probably couldn't understand. Like if you got a statement of all the data processing that was happening with, with automated decision making about you and your family and your community, you probably wouldn't understand it anyway but it has very real impact on our lives and our communities and our, and our futures. So I think that's another example of there's a whole hidden economy here that hasn't been kind of brought to the light. Well, and a couple of other really quick ones. Uh, apps that you download to your mobile device, which are to do with um, launching birds at pigs, but actually <laughs> copy your contacts information and send that to someone else. Um, is that unethical or just stupid? Well, I mean, so it's somewhere on it's somewhere on this spectrum of 
Um, we could probably write a legal <coughs> compliance statement yeah. about that, yeah. or we could write a legitimacy analysis of it, or as in under Gemma's model, we could write an acceptability statement about it. Um, and those those sort of three that progression of layers, I think, is something that this needs to unpack. Um, uh, Gemma, can we come to you, and then Daniel will come to you. Yeah, just an example. Sure, uh, very quickly. First, I. I'd rather talk about societal issues and not so much just ethics, and societal would include legal, ethical, and social at large, but if I say societal, I fear that most people don't understand what it means, and ethics seems to ring a bell with most people, and I think that's why it's been chosen by so many uh, of the stakeholders. Um, in terms of how, like, how do you make sure you have the right answers, um, I think one of the things that I've learned over this whole process is that you cannot let just one person or one group of people or one field of expertise make decisions on, on societal issues because they just don't have all the data. Um, one of the first things that we did, that I did, was spend six months reading everything that there was on, on ethics and social impact assessment. And one of the things that I found is that ethics alone tended to get things wrong because it didn't relate to social issues at large or to the law. So for a traditional ethicist, Mass surveillance, for instance, is better than targeted surveillance because there's no discrimination. From my point of view, that is totally unacceptable and it's illegal as well. So unless you have everyone on the table, I think we will all, we're all going to get it wrong. If you just leave me as a policy analyst, make decisions, there's, there's probably going to be things that I miss. And even with the broad range of people that we have at Ethicus working on these things, when we actually go and oversee the pilots, when one new technology is being piloted, we see so many things that we missed in the whole process. Even though we talk to all the stakeholders, we have lots of amazing things and we think we have it all nailed, nailed down. Once we actually see people interacting with that technology, there's lots of new things that come up. So I think that you need to make sure they have lots, the right people on the table, but also they, that they have ways of knowing the unknown. And so not, and not, not be arrogant enough to say, actually, you know, with my, all my, the books that I've read and all the experience that I have, I've, you know, I, I know what's going to be the outcome of this because then people surprise you. And in, and in this field, doing games and um, asking people to play that they're someone that they're not, like it's really, really useful in terms of um, getting to see the, the underlying social issues that technology might, uh, might bring about. In terms of examples, there's so many in our everyday life. Um, a few years ago, you could, you could still marry people on Facebook, even if they didn't marry you back. So I married John Stewart. And for a time, <laughs> in my oh. Facebook wall, you could see married to John Stewart, which is really great. Um, it was great also, you didn't have to know about that. Uh, but <laughs> <That's> <laughs> his wife. No, I didn't know. Um, but the interesting thing is that I did that because I like John Stewart, but also because I wanted to see how the ads changed. And it, that, was very, that was very fun to observe. So before I married John Stewart, it was all about uh, get a puppy, and sell your ovaries because you know you're over 30 and you don't seem to have a partner. After I got married, it was all about romantic getaways, and so it, it was it was fully loaded from a gender perspective. And if you're not critical enough, that kind of informs who you think you should be. And so and that happens all the time. And and Facebook, that was the only thing that Facebook seemed to be able to take in out of all the things that I do. Being married was the thing that most influenced my my ad um, stream. So that was that was interesting. Thank you. Other examples, there's profiling, algorithmic discrimination, social sorting happening all the time and just re reproducing the things that we do wrong in the, in the offline world. And we should, I think we should try for technologies to improve the offline world and not reproduce it or make it, or make it worse. And another thing that we find which is quite astonishing, in most of the technologies that we work on, there's so much discrimination of the young and the old. We tend to do technologies for um, male, white mature people because that's what the technologists that's what the engineers are i guess but it's just amazing so it's not just about black people or people you know people that we feel that are remote from us it's our grandparents and our children that are being systematically discriminated by these technologies wonderful okay well as you as you heard we just hit the five minute mark um i also happen to know i mean first it's a walk back from here to coffee second <laughs> in this room particularly with the wooden floor and the chairs it tends to get a bit noisy when people start to leave. So we will aim to wrap up, I think, you know, a couple of minutes early. Um, I've, I've picked up lots here about things that still need to be done, I think. Um, very, very briefly, um, conceptual framework still seems to me to be partial, um, taking Charles's comment into account. Um, if someone said to you, um, put, put the ethical model into practice using a deontological method, 
um, or analysis, you know, how does that fit in? What does it mean? And so on. So that, that I think, needs, needs fleshing out. Setting ethics in the practical context of law, society, and economics, for instance. Um, and, and I think many of our speakers have, have hinted at that. Um, making sure that there's the right level of stakeholder engagement, and particularly focusing on discriminatory issues um, to do with age, gender, sexual orientation, um, race, income, and so on. Um, and then finally, I think we've seen a really good example from Gemma of um, application frameworks for this. Um, and as I say, not, another quick plug for Michelle's book. I think that also helps people put these, uh, these theories into practice. Um, Daniel, sorry, I think I cut you off. Did you have five seconds more? Of just, just, just one, one, one word. And then we'll go to Re Jack. Regarding, I, I like this idea really of societal consequence because th this is the basic question. What is really the society we want ourselves and our children to live in? And the, the, the question is that these days we often hear about uh, massive surveillance by the government, which is indeed a risk. But today, personally, I think the risk is more massive surveillance by all marketers and all companies doing something crazy. You know, it's, it's crazy. That sounds so intuitively simple, doesn't it? <laughs> Ethics is about building the world we want our children mm -hmm. to live in. Um, but as Gemma said, if you actually ask an ethicist, so if you re read Derek Parfit's book, Reasons and Persons, he's got a whole chapter devoted to why it's totally invalid to make ethical decisions based on what you think will happen in the future. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so with what I think will happen next um, is that Jacques will sum up for us. Jacques, over to you. Well, that will be an extremely heavy task, I must <laughs> honestly say. Uh, I, I, I have, we have seen a lot of problems and methods that you can consider if you discuss uh, ethics. Uh, we also have seen various definitions or implicitly various um, conceptual understanding of what the word ethics really is. So I think that already created um, uh, a lot of problems. There came also some fundamental questions up from the examples, from the things that have been said with respect to the relation between machines and, uh, and systems on one side and people on the other side, and how that could reflect values in general. I think these were all the things that one would, con, uh, would expect. If I would uh, maybe come back a bit to um, a more, the more general point, and I would probably paraphrase Charles a little, a little bit, maybe not exactly what he meant, but more or less. I would say ethics is uh, and morality and moral rules and whatever the complex is, is more the glue which would allow societies to happen, to be, to behave uh, and to function properly. And the question that is really around is, Will digitization and communication uh, change or take away some of that glue? And uh, will we still have enough glue in the future for an ICT, for a digital society? Or do we have to think about making more or other uh, glue in order to make it work in the future? So I would like to keep it by here. Uh, we, as Digital Enlightenment Forum, will certainly still go on with this discussion. We have even a debate about digital ethics in the more general uh, context on the 1st of March. If you are interested in that, then you should let me know because it's on invitation. And therefore, I close here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you very much.